We are live! Greetings and salutations and welcome to a very special Explosive World Anvil stream because, of course, we have today the ever-amazing Lawrence Schick. Lawrence, how are you doing, first of all? I'm doing well. Hi, creative folks. Nice to talk to you. We um, are very excited to have you here today, Lawrence. Uh, where are you? Where are you calling in from today? Uh, I live in uh, South Dublin uh, in Ireland at the moment, um, uh, where I am uh, working for the uh, uh, Dublin studio of uh, Larian Studios um, on uh, Baldur's Gate Three. We are so hyped. Any little tiny tiny tidbits you can tell us, or is it all storm? Uh, nothing. Can't say a damn thing. Nothing. Um, uh, having a great time. I'm one of the lead uh, narrative designers. Um, it was uh, a surprise to me uh, to find myself working back in Dungeons and Dragons again after 40 years away from it. Uh -huh. uh, I didn't expect that, but uh, but here we are, and uh, um, it's a uh, it's a load of fun. And uh, uh, you'll be seeing you can see it now in early access, and it'll be uh, you know complete early next year, uh, and uh, it's going to be a landmark uh, that you won't forget. And uh, that's as far as I'll go. Oh my goodness. I am so hyped. I can see that the chat is so hyped. I'm looking forward to that game. Can't wait for BG3. Um, so much excitement for Baldur's Gate. We are, we are very excited. But guys, let me introduce Lawrence Schick because he is a man who's been everywhere and done everything. And uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, little bit surprised to be in his presence, but we'll see. We'll see. Lawrence Schick is a game designer and writer mainly known for role-playing games in the business for over 40 years. An American, he currently lives in Dublin, Ireland. We heard him say it, so we know it's true. He is the only person in games who's worked closely with both Gary Gygax and Sid Meier. That must have been an extraordinary experience. Uh, it was very educational. I uh, learned lots of stuff. Amazing. You know. uh, his uh, career began in, or oh, I should say your career, began uh, at TSR Hobbies in the late 70s, where you were a game designer and head of editorial staff. And then in the 80s, you moved to video and computer games, where you've done most of your work since then. Do you have a, right. do you have a highlight from that time? Uh, you mean from the 80s? Either, or, or from, from the 70s or uh, 80s. Uh, career well, highlight. Uh, yes, well, you know. Um, getting to get into the ground floor of video games and basically invent the way video game studios work, you know, at, at Coleco and then on to Microprose and places like that, that was great. Um, uh, it, 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 it all came from working at TSR, you know, in the early days of Dungeons and Dragons and uh, other games like Star Frontiers, you know, where we were also inventing a whole business as we were going along. And so, you know, uh, uh, it turns out that I'm good at making stuff up from nothing. Uh, so we, we learned how to, uh, how to invent, uh, you know, new categories of entertainment and then how to make businesses around them uh, and then how to, you know, uh, uh, crash and burn and lose millions of dollars doing that and then uh, come back again and start over. So uh, that's, uh, that's the cycle. The great cycle of life in in uh, in game design. Uh, so, the uh, cycle of gaming that is so incredible. And again, we are the things that we take as standard in video games are things that you guys were really putting together back then. Uh, yes, yes. In fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, levels, right? Uh, you know, experience, uh, uh, character progression. Uh, uh, all, none of that stuff existed prior prior to. Uh, uh, role-playing games and uh, early computer games and crpgs so and now they are uh standards that that people understand instinctively when you mention them uh they, they just know what that stuff means uh, because it's part of the culture absolutely and honestly it's uh it's gone beyond the computer game space this is stuff that is now common parlance this is stuff that influence gamification in offices gamification on on the internet gamification of all all kinds Yes, you see politicians talking about leveling up, yeah. uh, and uh, you know you know that they're they're full of shit, but they they know what, that they're communicating uh, something to to people when they say that. Absolutely, this has passed into common parlance. So I could gush exclusively about this. And guys, I encourage you to ask questions about Lawrence, about um, the seventies and the eighties, and the the creation from the ground up of this this space that we we all love and, and live in and create in and take for granted. So ask lots of questions because we will be doing those at the end of the stream. Uh, you can click the flaming anvil underneath the chat window and that will uh, help you redeem a question and get it seen and then get it sent over to me by the mysterious, marvelous secondhand samurai. Um, 
let's just get to the end of your incredible CV here. So as executive director of games at AOL in the late 90s, you were influential in the birth of online gaming. That must have been an incredible shift. Uh, you know, not so much um, because uh, uh, I had started out in uh, uh, tabletop games, which of course are collaborative and interactive and multiplayer and live, uh, and then gone to uh, uh, video games and computer games, um, which at first, of course, were single player. Uh, and uh, then we just crossed the streams, you know, and uh, uh, came up with uh, uh, interactive uh, role-playing games that could be hosted online on on, uh, on servers and where people could play with each other, you know, live and uh, and chat and eventually talk to each other. Uh, and so all of the things that we knew from tabletop games uh, were applicable to uh, to uh, the nascent uh, online gaming uh, business, um, including, you know, uh, dealing with difficult people uh, and uh, and uh, helping people who uh, uh, who wanted to uh, join in games and but were not themselves storytellers. Uh, build stories around their actions, you know. So that was that was great. We knew it was uh, uh, it wasn't uh, we were we were building on things that had already gone before. Um, so you know, when we got uh, uh, Ultima Online, you know, to the uh, to the AOL audience, um, then that was a big uh, that was a big leg up for the business, uh, and it just uh, kind of burgeoned and grew from there. Went into MMORPGs and the whole business that you see today, in which uh, Nearly every video game is is live and online and with the internet. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, of course, uh, probably the most familiar for many of our audience, the Elder Scrolls Online. You were a law master for Elder Scrolls, weren't you? I was. I worked there for uh, over nine years, which is you know el six lifetimes in the in the game design business. Um, uh, so, uh, no, that was great. That was uh, that was fun. Uh, I really enjoyed working in uh, in, in uh, Tamriel, and once again, it it uh, it was an MMORPG version of a single player series, and so it incorporated all the stuff that we had learned previously from these other different genres of, about uh, you know how to make the games work. Um, and uh, so it was, especially at the beginning, it was really exciting uh, because we were you know once again breaking trail and 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 making up new things and. Uh, uh, and then it turned into a, uh, uh, then we just got really good at continuing to turn out new annual content. Uh, and, uh, it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, it was great stuff and it was lots of fun and it was no longer new. So it was time to go and, and, and do other stuff. So here we are no, no longer working on Elder Scrolls, but I think about it all the time because the lessons from, uh, uh, from Elder Scrolls uh, uh, world building are, uh, you know, applicable to uh, uh, to uh, to all sorts of other uh, venues and, and roles and areas, uh, and uh, and it, it itself, you know, the Elder Scrolls was a uh, uh, compilation of of things that had gone before it. Uh, you know, it, it was it was um, uh, based in uh, in uh, Dungeons and Dragons and other. Uh, role-playing games that have gone before, RuneQuest, things of that sort. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, it uh, incorporated lessons from all of those, um, added to them, and uh, it was uh, uh, really uh, interesting to uh, uh, to see how the mix fit together and worked. Uh, so, yeah, Absolutely. it was a good time. Amazing. And again, we're going to be talking about some of those lessons that you learned about world building on uh, during your incredible career, because uh, that's what we do. We do world building and we do talking about world building and we do uh, hopefully, hopefully dropping some world building truths that will help all of us do some world building and writing and uh, game design better. And just as a side note, if Lawrence did not seem awesome enough. He also writes, edits, and translates historical fiction under the name of Lawrence Ellsworth. So you are hearing from an RPG designer, a game designer, uh, a CRPG designer, and a writer here today. You are hearing all of all of the different things that most of us are doing right now, all in a giant parcel of awesome. I, I, re I review movies too. We'll talk about that later. Also reviews movies. 
<laughs> so I think that is the perfect time to move to our questions. Let's kick off with a section about world building, since that is our core place. Um, and we'll start at the very beginning. How do you personally start out with a world building project? Uh, well, um, the uh, you, we're building worlds not for ourselves. You know, that's always the main thing to to keep in in sight. Um, we're building worlds to invite other people into them. Uh, so, what when you're considering a world that you're going to invite people in? Right. What is going to make it inviting? Uh, what uh, what are what are you building this world? What kind of fun are you proposing to get across to people with this world? Uh, and and how can you uh, uh, express the kind of fun that they're going to have, uh, you know, as as uh, in as quickly accessible and uh, concentrated a form as possible so that they look at your world and say, wow. I want to have that fun. That's the kind of fun I want. Uh, and I can see just based on the principles of what's being communicated here, what kind of fun this world is going to provide. Uh, and, and I can see, moreover, because it's a role-playing world, I can see where I fit in this world and you know how I'm going to make it my world uh, it, and, and share it with my friends, uh, hopefully. So, so that's what I think about. How am I going to you know, what kind of experience am I presenting uh, for players to have with themselves and their friends? Uh, so uh, it's that goes back to uh, obviously, uh, you know, whether you're you're doing something as a, uh, a video game that's single player or multiplayer or whether you're doing it as a tabletop game, you have to consider that that medium uh, that, that you're presenting it in. Um, and then you have to look because you want to connect with the players, you know, pretty much instantly as far as their expectations, setting their expectations. Um, you want to consider uh, aspects of genre. You know, what what genre of entertainment, of, of fun is my world presenting and how is it presenting it so that it instantly looks like it's going to give them something new in addition to what's familiar? Uh because they need to see what's familiar so that they grasp where you're coming from and where you where they're going to go. Um, but they also need to be enticed by what's new about this. Uh, what's what's uh, what what are they going to get to do that they haven't done elsewhere? Um, but which they're going to understand because it's in the genre that they're looking for. There. That's wonderful and so insightful. Those of you who have filled in your meta on World Anvil, these are the unique selling point questions. These are the player agency questions. These are the motivation questions, which are like, why am I, why am I building this, and and what's drawn me to this project, and 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 why do my players care about it? That that's the kind of space that we're talking about, isn't it? Uh, yes, very much so. You know, it's uh, uh, role playing games are inherently collaborative in nature. And, uh, you know, we're building worlds uh, that we want to share with people. Um, and uh, so we are, we have to build worlds that, uh, that they're going to want to enter and that they want to be in. Uh, and, uh, and that we want to welcome them into and welcome their contributions to them and not just tell them, you know, not just be a Lord Daddy and tell them all the stuff, right? Uh, I figured out this world and it's real solid and I know exactly who all the gods are and what its huge history is and you will be impressed by it. You know, no, you won't. Um, you're you're going to be impressed by uh, what are the, the cool, fun parts that you can interact with and how you can, uh, uh, you, you can be important in this world uh, that was actually, you know, originally uh, designed or at least, uh, collaboratively designed by other people. So that's um, wonderful. Do you have any tips for that, for making space for the players or um, or the other people who are interacting with your world building? Uh, yeah, there's there's things that I always tell, you know, younger designers uh, uh, who ha are fired up with their ideas for their uh, their cultures and societies and characters that they want to present. Um, and, uh, 
you know, and the, the thing you have to remember is that you have you have really cool ideas for really cool characters, and boy, are they tremendously impressive, and uh, and they must not be more impressive than the player characters, uh, because the player characters are the heroes, and your cool characters are the setting for those heroes, um, and so they can be really cool in an aspirational way, right? Like, wow, that guy's really cool, and I want to be as cool as that guy, and I can see how to get there. You know, then it's okay for your NPC to be uh, cooler than your than the player characters um, because they are the end product of a visible uh, ladder of uh, of character progression um, that uh, that you're going to lead them along. Um, but if you're just presenting your cool characters because you think they're really cool, you know, no, you're making a mistake. Um, you are there to present a uh, framework and a context in which the players can be cool, uh, because that's what they're going to remember. They're going to remember how goddamn cool they were when they strode into this dungeon and clobbered that uh, big bad end game monster. You know, um, so uh, that's uh, that's the experience they're going to take away and remember, and that's what they're going to thank you for. Right? They're not going to thank you because you presented this really tremendous uh, princess who has uh, all of these skills. Right? Um, you know, no. Uh, you're going to show them how to become that princess. Uh, that's the important thing. I love that. And I think it really speaks to the sort of the transformative and um, escapism elements of both CRPGs and RPGs. It's this, you know, I want to I want to go into a space where I'm the hero and I become better and I feel good about it, essentially. Yes, exactly. So you need to you need to remember that because this is a collaborative medium, uh, and you're collaborating, you're probably, unless you're writing a T TRPG all by yourself, you're probably working with other people. And even then you've got, you know, um, uh, artists and, uh, and editors and, uh, and play testers, and, and they're all collaborators too. Uh, and they're all contributing. Um, and if you're working on a video game, you know, you're working with dozens or hundreds of collaborators uh, in your studios. Um, and you are all working with the players who are the ultimate collaborators because they are going to come into your world uh, and they they come into your world knowing stuff and having experiences already from other uh, other games they've played, other movies they've watched, other books they've read. Um, and uh, so they've got ideas uh, and you need to leave room for those ideas. Uh, you need to not have this, you know, perfectly sealed, uh, every detail worked out, uh, uh, history and culture that there's there's no place for players to innovate anything. Um, uh, it, it's much better to sketch all that stuff in in the background. Uh, let the players fill in the blanks for themselves from what they know, because they know a lot. Uh, and then put the real attention to detail uh, in the foreground stuff that they're going to interact with, uh, because that's, um, you know, that's where you need to uh, 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 to really have uh, uh, a strong storytelling experience uh, is with the uh, uh, the individual characters that they're going to interact with, uh, the places they're going to be in, uh, and the uh, uh, the uh, audio and uh, visual environment that they're going to be inhabiting. Uh, so, so think about the foreground. Um, you know, you've. You've all been to theater productions, hopefully. Uh, think about, you know, the way set design works for theater productions and how very often the stuff that is the background uh, is really just sketched in. It's just it's just there to suggest where the action is taking place. Uh, and then in the foreground, the characters, the costumes, the, the furniture, the props, those are all detailed. Those are all clear. Uh, uh, those convey exactly... Uh, what the uh, production intends to convey uh, about uh, what's important in, in the given scene. So if you're thinking in scenes, you know, then, then you're, you're thinking in uh, uh, what is, uh, what is key to get across to, to, to your players and, uh, and you're not burdening them with stuff that, uh, that, that you thought up and, uh, and you think is really neat, but uh uh, you know, uh, why do they need to know it? Uh, it uh, a little bit of that goes a really long way. Uh, yeah. So that's that's there. That's uh, 
that's my little lecture on 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 scenery and backgrounds. I love that. That's fantastic. Um, I've I've now taken the interview a complete different way. Uh, in case you were wondering, I was not planning to ask these questions, but you keep saying these interesting things, so I'm going to keep saying asking follow ups about them. Um, uh, my next question is essentially how how do you find that translates to the the writing medium to the novel medium, for example, um, particularly with regard to sort of making space in your world building? Do you feel like that translates at all? Or do you think that the the fixed nature of main characters kind of negates that? Uh, it is different. Um, they inform each other, but it's a different medium for sure. Uh, it's, a, it's a linear tale that you're telling uh, in, in a novel or, you know, in, uh, I, I translate novels by Alexandre Dumas. So when I'm, you know, in one of his novels, he's a, 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 a a tremendously uh, talented uh, storyteller, um, as and he his story rattle along at a tremendous rate, uh, and uh, and he carries you along with it, um, and uh, uh, that's uh, that's that's very different from presenting a, a role playing game in which the player is deciding how things are how rapidly things are going to progress, right. Um, they're not following along. They're not caught up in this page turning thing they can't put down um, unless they're interested in actually racing through it, uh, in which case that's the experience they want. And you have to be able to accommodate that. Um, but that is their choice. Uh, and, you know, especially if they're hanging out with their friends, they're going to poke around in every corner. Uh, they're going to talk to every NPC. Uh, they're going to they're going to uh, look in every uh, openable container. Um, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, that's a, that's a play style that many, many, many people enjoy. Uh, and so, you don't want to, you don't want to take that away from people, uh, by telling them this is really important. Get going. You know, this important thing is happening now. Um, well, yeah, you know, sure. But what's in this, what's in this drawer? Uh, yeah. I am, I am the player that went around, um, Skyrim reading every single book. Mm -hmm. I am that player. Bless I'm you. sorry. We exist. Just hoovering up law. Um, so uh, back to your regularly scheduled questions. Uh, do you have a particular method you use for organizing your world building data? A categorization system, uh, a, a way of doing it, a visual way, a folders way? How do you manage this kind of data? Well, once again, uh, I am working in collaboration with other people. Uh, and so they are working in a number of different disciplines, uh, you know, uh, concept art, level design, uh, 3D world design, uh, uh, scripting of quests, uh, writing of dialogue, um, uh, doing cinematics. Uh, and so all of those folks have got their own ways of tracking information and assets and uh, version control of how as things change. Uh, and so, you know, as, as the person who is coming up with the 30,000 foot view of the world and the, and the story and who's important and why, um, I'm at the head of, of this waterfall of all these folks who are working on these things. So I need to accommodate their structures uh, of, of information. Um, you know, I need to uh, uh, present things in a way that they can use them uh, to create the world, uh, you know, that I have I have sketched out for them. And in the same way that I would, you know, just talking to about leaving room for players contributions, you know, uh, all of these people are, are tremendously creative and they've got their own ideas. Uh, and so you've got to give them space as well uh, to to contribute to all of these things. So, you know, when you're working with uh, working with uh, uh, all of these different disciplines and you're trying to get them to consistently and coherently create this world together um, so they want they want your input they want information they want lots of information but you know you're a writer and so you want to write uh, a hundred page description of the history of this location yeah don't do that um, or, you know, write it for your own information, right? But then break it up into dozens of bite-sized bits 
that you can give to the other disciplines that help them to understand the shape of this world and how all these pieces fit together uh, and in a way that is digestible for them so they're not overwhelmed. Because if you give them a gray pages of text, they simply will not read them. They just won't. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll start at the top until they hit some uh, important word that makes sense to them, that, that uh, helps uh, give them a nugget of information for what they're doing. And then they quit and they stop with that nugget. So they're, they're done, you know. So you have to, you have to accommodate other people's uh, uh, creative work in a way that uh, brings them along, gives them space, uh, doesn't overwhelm them, um, and yet gives them as much information as they want. And they want a lot of information. They have an unlimited appetite for reference material, uh, details, background stuff, as long as you give it to them bit by bit. And as long as it fits in the context of what they've seen before. So you're building a mosaic of all these little pieces. Uh, and that's, you know, uh, that's what makes the world coherent and consistent is that they all fit together. Um, yeah. And and a lot you know the folks who are working on this part over here are really really into making that part, and they don't really care that much about this part over here that these other folks are making, right? So don't burden these folks with the stuff that these people are doing unless they need to uh, fit together in some way, uh, and then you have to find a way to explain these different things, these different areas of information to each other. Um, so it's a uh, so, you know, what do I, <laughs> what, what system do I use? Um, it depends on, you know, every time you go to work at, a, at another studio, which is something I've done over and over. Um, you know, when I was uh, a youth, I had uh, nightmares about going into school and finding that it was a, a final test that I hadn't studied for it. Yeah, you know, the, no, the last couple of decades, I have nightmares about uh, waking up and I'm working at a new studio. And once again, I have to figure out how they do everything. Uh, and I have to persuade them that I am, in fact, useful to them. Uh, so uh, uh, because you're, you know, th yeah, exactly. They don't know who you are. You know, they don't know what you're good for. So you have to uh, you have to be useful. Um, so uh, the important system that I have is to listen to people and pay attention to what they're building and how they build it. Uh, and then uh, uh, take that information and use that to organize the information that I am going to give them uh, for their whatever aspect of world, build, world building they're doing. Uh, so uh, there you go. That was that was pretty long. That was wonderful. Um, Thank you. Um, so you mentioned that, you know, you you have as a game designer and you, you have to have as a world builder for these big worlds, this sort of 300 foot view, <clears throat> a 30,000 mm -hmm. foot view, however far away we're going. Um, do you have uh, methods or methodologies that you use to keep consistency with your world building, particularly in these large and multifaceted worlds? World history, the real world, the history of the real world. It is endlessly complex, interesting, fascinating, and it all hangs together. Yeah. Uh, so you can, you can find examples of what you want uh, from actual history uh, and then uh, just take the parts you need, uh, just take what looks useful, exaggerate it, uh, color it in bright primary colors and uh, you've got a fantasy world. Uh, so, um, you know, use reality as your basis. You can't do better than reality. Uh, it's, it's stronger than anything you will come up with yourself. <laughs> I, uh, I am all for that. Both my parents are archaeologists. I am the biggest nerd in uh, history, nerd in history. So, uh, that is, that is really awesome to hear. Um, what about mistakes? Now, I'm not asking you to call anyone out. This is this is a friendly space. But what are the biggest mistakes that you see, or some of the frequent mistakes that you see in writing and world building of others? Um. Wow. See, I have this long mental list of good examples. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, okay. Everybody has played games where. Uh, where, where you go in and uh, uh, you go into the world and like if there's a, a map or something like that or some visual representation of stuff nearby that's interesting, right? It starts to populate. Uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden, there are hundreds of things of interest within view, you know, on your map, 
or uh, in your HUD or just in your 3D view as you pan around or because you climb a tower and you you, you click on some surveying thing and, and then there's all this stuff and oh my God, you know, what, how do you know what of this stuff is more important than other stuff? What is the relevance of it all? Uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it seems like a good idea because you're, you're giving the player this panoply of all this cool stuff they have to select from, but they have no context uh, to use uh, to, to understand which of this stuff matters to them. Yeah. Um, there are many, many ways of playing RPGs. Everybody's got, you know, there's like 12 different play styles uh, that, that you need to try to accommodate. And so if you throw all this stuff out here that uh, is for everybody's play style at once, um, you know, they, they don't know how to pick and choose. So um, yeah. let people find their way through the world, uh, decide what they're going to pick up on, what threads they're going to pick up on, and then let those threads lead to other things that then matter to them, uh, because that's uh, uh, that way you you get them, you help them to build a story that matters uh, to to where they wanted to go and who they wanted to talk to and and uh, and, and what they wanted to involve uh, themselves in, uh, you know, rather than um, a, a rainbow display of uh, of uh, different icons with different shapes and different colors and uh, and little numbers next to them that you know. 12, 12 what, you know, so, uh, yeah, so uh, it's, don't do that. Uh, uh, what I'm hearing is don't overwhelm your players, essentially. Yes. Uh, uh, they need to be able to sort the signal out of the noise. Uh, so don't give them too much noise. Uh, let them pick the signal they want and follow up on that. I think that's definitely something that carries through to, from CRPGs to RPGs to, uh, even to novel writing as well, is, you know, there can be many things in a world, but making it clear which path people should or can be paying attention to, I think is something that really helps people progress and feel that feeling of progression. Right. Especially if they're picking the stuff that matters to them. Um, Absolutely. Uh, you know, then they think that you you are a brilliant world designer who has got a great story. Um, and uh, And in fact, you have enabled them uh, to to create a great story, uh, which is, uh, uh, but you still get the credit, so that's that's fine. <laughs> so they tailor their own experience, essentially. Yes. Yeah, that's really really clever. So we've talked about mistakes to avoid. What do you think are some wonderful examples of world building that we can learn from, and why do you like them? Um, so, uh, one of my favorite things about working in Tamriel and the Elder Scrolls, okay. Um, is the way that they present uh, the world background and the lore, um, which is that, you know, unlike, uh, you know, Game of Thrones, where there's, uh, you've got uh, George R. R. Martin who made everything up and is the, is the big the big lore daddy who decides what was true and what isn't, you know, or uh, I'm currently working in the Forgotten Realms, right? So uh, that's got, uh, uh, vast quantities of background history of, of all sorts of information that you can draw upon. Um, but it's already, it's already laid out. Right. And it's, there's, there's a, there's a history of stuff that is true. Um, in the elder scrolls, uh, uh, every, every character that you meet, every NPC that you meet, um, has a double agenda as far as the, their their purpose in the world, right? One is the usual purpose for NPCs, which is that they are advancing the plot and providing you with, uh, uh, you know, uh, what you need to do and why. Um, but uh, in in the Elder Scrolls, every NPC also uh, is has their own personal agenda. Uh, they have a cultural background. They have a society they come from. They have. Uh, uh, political and religious beliefs within those societies, and those inform what they tell you, uh, so that what they everything that they say to you uh, has is shaded by their own personal background, and that's the only way that you get lore and information uh, inside uh, the Elder Scrolls is from the NPCs themselves or from the stuff they've written, uh, and it's all from their viewpoint. So they're reliable narrators. Exactly right. 
Uh, and uh, so you get all of this stuff, which is uh, inconsistent, um, which is just like the real world, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's rich, it's deep. Um, it, uh, it tells you every time somebody talks to you, they're telling you not just about the world you're in, but about themselves and how they see their place in it. Uh, so it, it, uh, it, it makes the world feel really interesting and fascinating and draws you in. And it also gives you agency in deciding which of these people you believe and, you know, who's got the right idea and, uh, and what's really important uh, you know, when you're working in the Elder Scrolls is to never confirm or deny what the actual reality is, uh, because the actual reality is what the NPCs think it is. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was uh, that was a, a, a really fun way of dealing with conveying um, world background uh, and which I think is is a, uh, a really valuable approach that could be adopted uh, you know, in whole or in part, uh, uh, in other areas, and 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 it would pay off, I think, well. Uh, uh, and you know, it, it all goes back to shared world design, um, which is another uh, another topic for another day. But uh, um, yeah, it, it and it, uh, uh, it, uh, it 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 uh, that's a that's a thing that uh, that I, I I think should be more recognized as a, as a valuable approach um, yeah. rather than, I mean, the easy thing to do is just to say, yeah, here's the way the world works. These guys made this stuff up, you know, and that th those people do that. And here's our history and, uh, uh, and we're done, you know, let's, let's just, let's just go on. Um, but, you know, ambiguity is much more fun. Uh, so uh, let's be ambiguous. Yeah. I particularly love that point. Um, that not only do they tell you their opinion, but they tell you something about who they are. So my little mantra is exposition should always be in motion and emotional. And again, that's such a great way of doing that, of putting it in the mouths of NPCs who um, are you know, casual or, or passionate about whatever it is they're trying to convey, but telling you something beyond the words that they're saying. I think it's that's that's so, so clever. Uh, let us go on and talk about what we want to achieve. We've talked about structuring world building. We've talked about um, you know, how we start world building. What are some of the most important things you seek to achieve with your world building and your storytelling? And what are your favorite tools in your toolbox for achieving them? Okay, so what I want to achieve is I want the player to be so immersed in the world that the stuff that I have designed fades away um that you know they're they're no longer aware of the fact that this was written by a, a bunch of people in a studio somewhere um they are thinking about only about the fact that uh, uh they have a place in this world uh and uh, it has it has its priorities and you have your priorities in interacting with it um and and that's all that matters um so you know i want to uh I want to disappear. Uh, I want the uh, I want the uh, the world to come alive uh, to an extent that uh, uh, you're thinking about your place in it rather than uh, you know, geez, look at that tree. That tree is blue. That's really a stupid color for a tree. You know, uh, don't we? You, you want you don't want you want everything to to uh, be consistent and hold together and and uh, just make make it all. Um, uh, contribute to the uh, immersion factor of being there. That's so, wonderful. Yeah. So what are your favorite tools for achieving that? Like how, how do we achieve that as, as game designers? Um, uh, you need to remember that stories, role-playing games are about stories and stories are about people. Uh, and so, the important thing is that you are telling stories that matter about what matters to people. Uh, and if, 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 if it matters to your NPCs, um, <clears throat> if they're really passionate about what's going on with them and they convey it convincingly, um, it's going to matter to the players. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, uh, 
the key point is that that uh, you want to you want to involve the players to the extent that that they have a strong emotional reaction to what what they're doing and what choices they're making. Um, so that means that you need to build a world in which the player's choices actually make a difference. Yeah. Agency. Uh, because, yeah. Yes. Uh, because, you know, they know within 10 minutes whether they're in a world where the choices that they make matter uh, yeah. and, and they, they change things and they uh, change what is going to potentially happen and what's going to be available. Um, and uh, uh, or, or if they're in a world where they're simply stepping through um, a scenario that is predetermined. Uh, uh, which, you know, that works great for things like first person shooters, uh, you know, RPGs, not so much, uh, yeah. uh you know, um, you, you need to, uh, you need to give people, um, a feeling that, uh, uh, what they're doing matters to themselves and to the people they're interacting with. Uh, so, you know, geez, come up with, come up with quests, uh, and with stories that, uh, that, uh, that convey meaningful and significant uh, change on the parts of, of the players and that really matter to those NPCs, you know, rather than just, just, uh, you know, bringing them their grandfather's uh, lost uh, jewel studded sword, you know? Um, uh, yeah. It's, sure. So the stakes should be real and personal to yes. the NPCs. Mm -hmm. Well said. And, Wish I'd and I guess preferably to the main character as well. Uh, right. In some way, if you can, if you can possibly swing it. <laughs> well, you know, uh, you should both have a relationship with these NPCs and forge a relationship with these NPCs in a way that you want uh, to. You know, you want to be able to push your relationship with them in a different, in a direction that matters to you. So, uh, so there's got to be a relationship. There, it's got to be. Uh, these need to be. You need to think of these people as people. Uh, and, uh, but remember, you know, they're there to provide a context for the player's emotional experience, um, yeah. which means that, you know, there needs to be real emotional stakes. Um, but, uh, but, uh, uh make sure that the, it's the player who is, uh, uh, deciding what, uh, what matters and, and how, how it's going to uh, play out in in their mind because when something really emotionally important happens that's what they find memorable that's what they go back to that if they're play if you're playing multiplayer with other people you know and you you talk later on about uh, that game that you played that's the thing that always comes up you know was uh, that scene um, so yeah, absolutely. And um, that's how our memory works as humans. Like we are trained to remember things of high emotional impact. So um, like that, that's what imprints. That's why smells can create strong, strong experiences, because we remember the association. That's why, why you know, when we remember a game, we remember that heart wrenching moment where the NPC companion dies and then you have to avenge them or, or what have you. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Any tips on creating those kinds of relationships? I know I'm really digging into this question, but I'm really interested in it. I think it's 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 a real, I mean, talking to you is a real masterclass in, in game design, but this particularly, getting your players to feel something, getting your readers to feel, that's why we do the thing. So any tips on there for, you know, creating relationships with imaginary people, essentially, is what I'm asking. Um, don't give your players easy answers. Mm. Uh, give them choices that are inconsistent, uh, that that mitigate against each other, um, so that they have to make a choice that is hard, uh, and that you know you win something by picking this choice, but you lose something else, uh, and so do the people you're interacting with, and that is matters to them, and so then it matters to you, right? So. Um, create situations that don't just have like this golden path that is is the way through. Um, create situations uh, that create uh, uh, emotional dilemmas uh, that uh, that you have to solve, and where you have to 
make a choice. And, 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 you know, the choice that you have to make is not going to be perfect. Somebody's going to get hurt. Uh, uh, that those, that, that gives your story weight. Um, so, uh, you know, don't, don't think of your story as a puzzle to solve. Uh, think of it as a, uh, think of it as a potential drama waiting to happen. Uh, and then make sure that's dramatic. Uh, so. I love that. I think uh, one of the mistakes that game designers can make is that they forget to create cogs that go both ways. So we create these cogs in our games um, where, you know, players can interact with something, but, you know, creating things that go two ways means that the players can make two choices. And each of those choices is choosing for a group or against a group or choosing for an NPC and against an NPC, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could talk about this all day. Lawrence, you have been just so wonderful, but I must do some audience questions. So I would like Fair to enough. start with an excellent one from TJ, who says, do you have any world building tips for creating impactful timeline events? And we've impactful. touched on this. A oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry. Go on. You're I was going to say, we've touched on this a little bit already when we were talking about drawing inspiration from history. But um, yeah, impactful timeline events. Um, uh, are you talking about events that interact with the history of the world that you're talking about? Or what do you mean by a timeline event? Uh, give me some uh, so essentially, yes, events in your history that are impactful, either emotionally impactful or impactful on the world, I'm assuming. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, they need to be... You, people tend to think of those kind of events uh, with the... Uh, what. What used to be called the great man theory, right? Where you, where you, would, there would just be about this person and uh, and their antagonist and uh, how those how they interacted and then how it all came out uh, and yeah. uh, and it was all a matter of the uh, the choices made by these uh, these key individuals. Um, well, you know, yeah, there are key individuals, but think about the uh, the people that surrounded them and think about the import of the decisions that they made uh, and think about the impact of those decisions upon the social society and the culture uh, in which the story is occurring. Uh, and in fact, how that impacted this person that you're talking to right now. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, don't just think about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the superhero battles um, at, the at the top of the, uh, uh, the food chain. Uh, you know, think about the implications of, of, uh, what those mean to uh, to people uh, all, all the way down, uh, uh, because especially in most you know RPGs, you start off as a relatively humble character, uh, and so you're going to be dealing at first with people who are as as humble as you are, or or nearly so, um, uh, because you are of course fated to become mighty and and powerful and one of these movers and shakers, um, but um, when you are humble. Uh, you know, you, you get a chance to see the world through the eyes of these other folks, and that gives you the basis, the foundation for the, uh, you know, world-shaking events that are going to follow. Uh, you can't shake a world unless you've built the world. So, uh, you know, start at the bottom uh, and, uh, uh, and, and think it through that way. Wonderful. Thank you so much. M. Gata asks, what advice do you give to new designers who are starting out in video games? Hmm. That was a wonderful mug, but can I just say? Oh, thanks. It's a <laughs> American Renaissance Fair mug. I got a whole nice. bunch of them. Um, so, uh, yeah, someone starting out. So, there aren't a lot of entry level disciplines that kind of feed into video game design. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's sort of editorial assistant. There's quality assurance. Uh, there's uh, community management, um, and those are all really good entry-level areas that teach you different aspects uh, of the very complex uh, business uh, and and art and creativity of of, of building video games. Uh, because you know, from the outside, it's it's really hard to understand all the stuff that happens behind the scenes and all of the uh, interrelationships between 
the different creative uh, folk who, who who put this thing together. Uh, and so, you know, coming in uh, at one of those uh, entry level areas uh, gives you a grasp of, uh, of of how the whole thing is put together uh, from that viewpoint. Uh, and then you you know you can move from there into uh, into the other areas that uh, that interest you. Often things that you didn't even know you were going to be interested in. Um, um, so yeah, you know you're going to be you're you're going to be looking for one of these uh, one of these areas where uh, some place that your personal uh, energy and drive and passion and uh, uh, meticulous attention to detail uh, is going to uh, uh, benefit the project um, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, so it's community management, uh, quality assurance, uh, you know, editorial, uh, uh, editorial assistant, that kinds of things uh, are, are what you're looking for. Um, because, uh, because nobody just goes in and, and, uh, and becomes a uh, cinematic lead, you know, or a uh, 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 s- gameplay systems combat lead, you know, or anything like that, you know, no, you, 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 you spend a long time uh, figuring out the details. And so uh, go into it for the long haul and, uh, and just decide that, uh, you know, this is going to take a while. Some great advice there. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Secondhand Samurai, who is our moderator, who will come get on an airplane, fly to Greece and shove walnuts up my nose if I do not ask it. So here you are. What prompted you to take a stab at documenting all of the RPGs in English before the internet was even there to help? He is, of course, referencing your Heroic Worlds, A History and Guide to Role-Playing Games, which was published in 1991. He is a super fan. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was an act of madness. Um, uh, you know, I just uh, uh, I got... I knew a lot of people, uh, okay, by the, around the end of the '80s, in, in the role-playing game business, um, and I was, uh, I had sort of grown up with the with the publication of all of these uh, different uh, uh, games and all of their their various uh, components and uh, expansions and uh, uh, modules and uh, accessories, um, and I knew where it all was, and and so just you know I. I just get these ideas sometimes. You like, or I think, you know, I could do this. I can see how to do this. Um, this is crazy. This is dumb. This will take years to complete, but I can see how to do it. Yeah, you know. So, so I'm going to do it. So, uh, it was the same with that uh, as with, uh, you know, when I, uh, when I discovered uh, uh, the the components of the. Uh, Dumas uh, long overlooked uh, lost novel, The Red Sphinx. I said, you know what? I could translate this and put this together. Uh, and then if I get it published, I could do the whole series. I see how to do it. Um, you know, I'll just uh, I'll just learn more French. Uh, it'll be great. Um, I'll just study the, the bejesus out of uh, uh, early modern uh, Europe. Uh, so um, it, it's fine, you know. Uh, um, and so that, that's how I undertook doing, you know, a nine volume translation of Alexander Dumas uh, Musketeers novels. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I've got another project going on where where I'm I've been reviewing uh, uh, movies uh, of involving swordplay, you know, movies about knights and pirates and samurai and and uh, 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 Robin Hood and Zorro and uh, uh Sinbad and all of these uh, these great heroes, and so I started doing reviews of these little pocket reviews of these, uh, uh, yeah, uh, little pocket reviews of these uh, uh, these movies, and uh, and uh, I, I post them online, and uh, and then they were they proved popular, and so I got uh, um, Blackgate.com, which is a a genre fiction website. Uh, asked me to, you know, compile these things into a weekly article and started started doing that. And I said, you know what? I could uh, I could write reviews of every single one of these movies from uh, the silent era, uh, you know, up until the present, uh, and uh, and then publish that as a book. I could do that too. Uh, so so I set out to do that. Only, you know, we had to quit at 1989 because that that's 
how big the book got. Um, so uh, that the uh, Cinema of Swords will be uh, uh, coming out uh, from Applause Books uh, uh, sometime in 2023, uh, covering uh, every one of those uh, uh, swordplay movies uh, with an English uh, language version of some sort and, and some sort of availability. You know, 400 plus movies plus TV shows and stuff. Uh, yeah, that was a dumb idea, but uh, you know, I just I could see how to do it, so I did it. So. <laughs> Okay, well, um, you are among friends, Lawrence. Many of us here go, oh, my God, we could totally do this thing. And then we do it. So, yeah. you know, welcome welcome to the World Anvil community. It's full of mad people with crazy ideas. I would just like to say um, a little bit more about Court of Daggers, your Musketeers cycle. So you're currently publishing this um, uh, as a serial fiction, right? Uh, that's right. Um, the first, uh, like I said, is a nine-volume Nine volumes of uh, of uh, Dumas Musketeers books, and uh, uh, the first five were uh, published in mainstream format, uh, and uh, uh, and then you know mainstream publishing is a dodgy prospect, and uh, so uh, number six is not being published in mainstream format. Um, so I had to figure out how I was going to publish it, uh, and uh, I could just do it as an ebook. And uh, as, as a print-on-demand paperback, I've done that before. I, I know the routine. But then I thought, you know, that's not how Dumas did it. Uh, the way he did it, he wrote these things in chapters. Um, and just, just he just said, I can see how to do this. And published the chapter, you know, week after week in these uh, uh, French uh, weekly newspapers of the uh, mid-19th century called the Fouilleton. Uh, and uh, so I said, you know what? We could do that nowadays because now we have this these uh, uh, subscription based serial platforms like Substack, uh, which are uh, essentially the same uh, uh, the same situation only in in in, in modern guys. Um, so we can take I'll take the Musketeer cycle back to its roots, uh, and so now I am publishing book six, Court of Daggers, on Substack uh, as a, a subscription. And uh, every week you get, uh, you know, one or two chapters of this uh, and it unfolds the same way that readers read them in the middle of the 19th century, which I think is cool. Uh, uh, so uh, and then, you know, when it gets done, it'll be compiled into a into a, uh, a conventional book. Um, and uh, but for, for the moment, we're going on and we're doing the rest of the Musketeers cycle uh, the, the way Dumas did it. So. Very cool. Well, I know we have a lot of serial fiction writers here who publish with World Anvil serially, so I'm sure they'll be thrilled to know that you are doing exactly the same thing. That is incredibly cool. Any final words of wisdom for us today, Lawrence? Uh, final words of wisdom. I hope they're not too final. <laughs> um, uh, uh, just, you know, don't when you're when you're working through your world design and and coming up with your backgrounds and stuff uh and you realize that you've got a better idea than what you did before you know don't hesitate to just throw out the stuff you did before and do the better idea because it's better uh and uh, it's you, you're going to be happier in the long run um and the stuff that gets thrown out isn't wasted you know, yeah. you thought you, you, you worked through all that. You thought through that process. You learned from doing that. Um, but it, it's got to go, you know, so uh, do the better stuff. Um, uh, don't worry about the fact that those ideas aren't getting used. Right. You personally have an unlimited number of ideas. Uh, so, you know, just use the best ones. Uh, so that's that's my final advice. Don't hesitate to kill your darlings, as they say in uh, fiction writing. Wonderful. Lawrence, thank you so very, very much for today. There are yells from the chat. They want you back. Um, I will not put you in a difficult place by asking you to come back live on stream, but we would love to have you back another time to come talk about world building and game design and writing. Well, we'll talk. We'll see if I can, uh, you know, I, I, that may have been all my ideas, as far as you know. I may not have any more ideas. So Nonsense. Um, but, I, uh, yeah. I have a feeling there's a lot more there. Lawrence, thank you so very much today. Uh, just a quick reminder that our Rivers and Waterways World Building Challenge is now closed, the writing period. So if you want to get sharing, now is the time. Our judges are going to get reading. Um, so uh, yeah, Rivers and Waterways, they're awesome. 
And uh, coming up next, because we're doing that today, we have a very special stream where um, Kitoy Poi is going to be running a one shot called Where Is My Alligator? Information that will be delivered very shortly. I would, of course, like to thank you all very much for joining us today. A big thank you to Secondhand Samurai for managing the questions, managing me and generally keeping things on track. And I would like to invite you to stay exactly where you are. Grab your hammer and go world build. Coming up next, guys. See you shortly. <laughs> <laughs>